Good evening, everybody. Welcome to February's edition of Cancer Prevention and Wellness, presented by the Cancer uh, presented by the Cancer Survivors uh, uh, Park uh, Alliance. Uh, we'll get started in just a couple minutes. Good evening and, and welcome. Um, thanks so much for joining us um, live uh, for our Cancer um, Prevention and Wellness Series. Um, we have, a, I think, an excellent topic uh, tonight, an excellent speaker. Uh, before we get started, a couple of housekeeping um, uh, items. Um, first of all, everybody on the call will be muted. Uh, we do not really want you not to speak, but you'll have to speak via the chat function, which uh, I will be monitoring. Um, and um, uh, we, we do not want to not have you ask questions. So uh, please uh, be involved with this. We want this to be interactive. Our speaker will probably ask you some questions through, through the course of the talk. Um, we are recording uh, this um, uh, session, and uh, this will be on our website at uh, cancersurvivorspark.org uh, in the next 24, 48 hours. Um, so I uh, would like you to be um, aware of that, and if you find that this is particularly helpful uh, to tell your friends and colleagues and cancer uh, patients and cancer survivors and their caregivers uh, all about um, this this topic uh, tonight. Uh, we are really very excited to have Dr. Ellen Vincent with us. Uh, Dr. Vincent is a um, uh, senior lecturer at uh, the in the faculty of uh, the Department of Horticulture at Clemson University. Um, she is um, a member of the International Society of um, a board culture, a certified arborist, and is on a number of editorial boards. Uh, so she's uh, very qualified uh, to talk about uh, what she's going to talk to, about tonight, which is healing spaces, healing gardens, healing landscaping. Um, and uh, with with that, I'll I'll let her um, take it from there. Uh, Dr. Vincent, welcome. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with all of you. I appreciate the time. So this topic is healing gardens, hospitals, and more. And we'll do a tour of this topic. And my slides are not advancing. Does Laura have a suggestion? Um, try, try closing your PowerPoint and pulling it right back up. Hit escape, you mean? Yep. Okay. Nothing's happening when I hit that. Oh, no. Maybe we're oh, wait, it just worked. It just worked. There we go. <laughs> Great. We'll start out with the definition of you have health. To hold your mouth just right. I don't know. As long as it keeps working, I'm fine. Um, we'll start with the definition of health and what is it? And here's one definition that I appreciate and that it's multidimensional. Every area affects the other. And you have to pay attention to all of these when it comes to health, according to Wilbert Gessler, who we'll learn more about in just a few moments. 
And then there's the World Health Organization definition of health, which always causes me to pause and, and just, just appreciate this, that it is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So that's a very good one. So if we look at historical healing, we can start with the hospital cloisters concept. And a cloister, again, has multiple definitions. It can be a covered walk with an open colonnade. It can be a place devoted to religious seclusion. It can be life in a monastery or a secluded, quiet place. And I would just ask you if you can think of a place that might feel like a cloister, where it's a secluded, quiet place, where you're surrounded by plants, a covered walk, buildings, a quadrangle. If you've ever had that, you might just kind of think about it for a moment. And if you find it, you'll know that you're looking at a, maybe a modern day version of a cloister. And the cool thing about cloisters that I read in this book is that in the 1500s, one of the things that people did when they were conquering was to not necessarily go out and try to kill people, but they would destroy the plant life because that, again, would harm the people in a certain community. But what the monks did was to go out and gather healing plants and bring them within the walls of the monastery where they could protect them and use them for pe people who came for healing. So that was kind of interesting to me. Were the monasteries um, kind of hands off as far as um, military was concerned? Um, in the sense that what I had read in this book, at least, is that most of the military did not permeate the walls of a monastery, that I they know. were considered to be a relatively safe zone. Okay. And here's an example of a cloisters um, that is current today, Mont Saint Michel in France. And this is the very top, 240 feet high. And that brings us to this whole concept of the path to the top. And natural built and symbolic elements are usually found in most healing environments. And at the very base of this place, there is the picture you see on the left. It's um, flowering plants and grasses just growing wildly for a large space. You walk through that and by that as you get to the entrance to go up to the 240 feet. You climb this by foot. And as you're climbing, you're past places that look like the center where you get um, the, the stone, you get the wood, you get the plants, natural built and symbolic all together. Built would be the, the door and the stone, but the symbolic could be the arch. That's something very beautiful, usually about arches, that is a calming effect um, for some people and not all, of course, but that's the nature of symbolism. And if you look on the right, that's also could be very symbolic. When you get to the top, it's a way to, to keep people in a path, to keep them from going different places. And they use rope that goes through metal and the metal just weaves around the rope. You can brush up against it and there's no um, abrasion that can occur. It's soft on the hand. It's just absolutely beautiful. I've never seen anything like it. And when you're trying to herd people, keep them in a row and a line and keep them moving, what an elegant way to do that. So that's part of the architecture. Hmm. And here again is some more built elements. We've got the doorways that you see, again, surrounded by stone and the artwork that occurs within this. All of this beautiful artistry is part of the built environment, even the ornamentation on the doorknob. And I'm somebody who loves peeling paint on doors. Um, I know that's not appealing to everybody, but I find it just to be when it's around stone and plants, it just kind of fits for me. Distressed. <laughs> That's another word. Right. <laughs> I call it charming. <laughs> and then as you get towards the top, you'll be able to see, again, this is natural and built. The built would be present in the roofs and the tops of the buildings, and the natural is in the viewscape. And here we have um, a water body that is frequently at low tide, and that's what we're seeing right now. 
And this is part of the pilgrimage. And the pilgrimage is always part of a healing environment historically. Because if you think about how we drive by cars and buses and different, you know, um, motorized vehicles, we get places very fast. But back historically in the 1500s, people had to move by foot, by horse, um, by other animals. And it was a much slower process. And the pilgrimage was all part of the healing. What did they pass by? Where did they go? Who was with them as supportive agents? It's all of that was part of the healing process. And this is the top again. And here we have um, natural in the form of plants and the view built in terms of the colonnade and the arches could be symbolic. The shapes of the greenery could also be considered symbolic order if you if you like order um, and then the view that you have here and the next picture will give you if you walked up there and you and you were just looking out of that arch this is what you see so not bad if yeah. you're looking for healing and you're trying to um what we'll learn in a few minutes is called a positive distraction if you're trying to imagine yourself somewhere that um, can just take you to a different place that could do that. This may not be something you know, but who maintains that now? Is that the government or is that um, uh, some religious order? I don't have the answer to that. I'm okay. sorry. Yeah. But they do a very good job. Uh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, obviously, it, it, it's worthy of being uh, kept up. Yeah, yeah. And so next, if we look at, there's some additional historical healing places as defined by Wilbert Gessler, who is a retired, hired professor from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, who then moved on to England to live. And he has many books that are worth reading. He has a background in geography and healing places is the one that I used. And this is where he developed the concept of therapeutic landscapes by looking at Epidaurus in Greece, Bath in England and Lords in France. This is where he found these concepts and found them to be true, seeing them in these historic places. And the first location was um, the temples of Asclepius. And I just, um, again, these are the books here. You would able to find those on Amazon if you're interested. Um, here's Epidaurus, Greece. And this is the site of the temples of Asclepius. These were located usually next to mountains or at the base of mountains or alongside of a mountain, but they weren't covered with trees. They were views of mountains, views of trees. Usually you could see water or hear water. And there was, there was sunlight and there was fresh air. Those were the elements you'd find in the locations for the temples of Asclepius. And people would go there to sleep. And apparently um, once you entered your intention was to um, socialize with other people in this open space. They called it a dormitory. And you would then, and they also had in this, in this open space, they had snakes and they had dogs. They were both considered healing agents. And apparently the snakes were not poisonous and the dogs would lick wounds. So those are just, again, some things that I have learned from Wilbert Gessler and his historical data. And so people would supposedly go here and sleep and have dreams. And during the dreams, they were supposed to um, be given insight into something that could help heal them. And that was just part of what people did. So it was a pilgrimage to get here. It was the space they were in while they were here um, that was just so beautiful. And the other interesting thing that I found is that people didn't just stay sequestered in the dormitory. There would be amphitheaters outside and that's where people would sit and actually listen to music and watch performances. And that whole socialization um, was part of the healing process. So it was very interesting to read about these historical places. This is Bath, England. And the destination here, the intention was to get yourself in a mineral bath for healing. And um, this is really nice because this is where we got to see the beautiful plumbing capabilities of the Romans. They were the first to install the irrigation and plumbing that caused water to be able to be manipulated in this way. So this was very um, famous, lots and lots of history. Um, people still go to Bath, England to um, be able to dip their hand or their foot 
or to go into a mineral bath. Um, just to get another healing environment. And then Lourdes, France. And this one, some of you may have actually been to, it's still extremely popular. And people will line up for hours to get in. And I'm sure this wasn't like this during the pandemic, um, but this is before pandemic, this information. People would line up to get in here. And um, again, they were looking for water and spaces to touch. And apparently it was a lot, um, a lot of touristy type of stores and such at, around the base of this where you could you know, buy mementos. But again, if you think about the whole social process brought people to this location and they got to know each other. And, um, and apparently it just has a lot of healing effects for many people, of course, not for all. And historically, we can look at the work of Florence Nightingale and she was monumental for changing the foundations and the flooring and the construction of the interior of the hospital. She was somebody who was looking to make sure that the wards were not crowded with people, that there was fresh air, good light, and good drainage of water. So she was instrumental and just to this day is celebrated for her good work at, at making these changes to the historic hospital system. And the architect Bernard Poyer in France was another one. And he would design with rows of long windows and long hallways looking for cross ventilation. And this is something right now that a modern architecture firm out of Poughkeepsie, New York called Mass, M-A-S-S, -S, is back to designing, um, is making sure that cross ventilation is now being installed back in buildings um, as part of the healthy architecture system. And beds were spaced apart and the beds had window views. That was instrumental and critical because that was not considered to be beneficial um, or not necessarily designed in architecture for hospitals before this. And again, sanitary facilities moved away from the patients instead of being stored right next to where a person was. And here you see another image, and this is um, the St. Thomas Hospital in London in the 1800s. And this one was designed for ventilation, for airiness, and sunlight. And then we move into more modern work for therapeutic nature in hospitals by Roger Ulrich. And Roger Ulrich um, is really, really famous in this field. Um, some of you probably already have heard of him but um, he's a professor of architecture at Texas A&M, and he developed the concept of positive distraction. And what he found through his studies is that nature and realistic nature art are the ideal positive distractions from stress and pain. And there's a lot of researchers who came up with this same um, information, which helped Roger Ulrich to develop this concept. And other positive distractions that um, he identifies include laughter, music, and companion animals. And I find that um, to prove really true, even in the college classroom, where I spend most of my time, I've noticed in the classroom, if anybody causes laughter, the whole classroom just starts to relax and become more creative. And whenever we have anybody who will bring in a companion animal, either because they have to, or because they've asked permission to for some reason, all the room tends to get calmer and just more open and relaxed. Um, and I'm guessing that I just haven't had anybody allergic to dogs in those classes. <laughs> so he did a very famous study and this was published in Science um, Journal. And what he did was he looked at data from gallbladder surgery patients from a hospital in Pennsylvania. And they were looking at patients who um, in their hospital rooms, half of these people had a view of trees and half had a view of a brick wall. And the people with the view of trees, it was not a manicured, beautiful, you know, specially landscaped tree lot. It was just trees out the window. It was nothing, you know, that anybody had intentionally made into a, you know, a treescape. It was just there. And so that was what they looked at. And they all had the same nurses. Um, so there weren't a lot of variables um, to cause distraction in this study. And they just looked at the patient's records, mining the data. And the people with the view of trees um, left the hospital sooner and they complained to so nurses. The other people had a 
I had a view of the bricks. Brick wall. Mm -hmm. brick wall. Yeah. Wow. The brick wall people were, stayed in the hospital slightly longer. And the people with view of trees um, complained less to nurses, which I thought was, was a really <laughs> interesting observation. And this is looking again at the records. That's how they came up with this. They took um, the people who had the tree view took less potent painkillers and they also scored slightly lower for minor post-surgical complications. So this was significant. And this study um, has really, really informed the industry. There was another study that he um, participated in, and this one was done in Sweden, and this was on open heart surgery patients. And they had a selection of images that were mounted to a um, small board that was clipped to the bed of the patient. And the nature pictures had either trees or water or both in them. There were abstract pictures that had curves and rectangular forms in them. And then there was the control. And the control was either no picture or just a white panel by itself. And they found that the people exposed to nature with water picture had less post-operative anxiety than all the other groups. They had um, people who looked at the abstract pictures had higher anxiety than all the other groups. And then four days after surgery, they found that people who looked at any type of picture were able to complete a visual perception functioning test faster than individuals who did not have any image of at all in front of them, the control groups. And here's a picture of what some abstract images could look like in case, you know, you just need a reminder of that. And I like to put these up because imagine some people love these. They're really exciting and fun. You can get imaginative with these. But if you think about having surgery and um, perhaps being queasy, being dizzy, extremely tired, um, this, this could cause distress. And that's what was found in their study. These are not the images that they used. I just came up with these to share with you um, how abstract um, could not be a calming, soothing gaze. I don't think I'd want to see the upper right one. <laughs> Me either. No. No. <laughs> but I always find there's exceptions to the rule. When I've done my research, um, with nature images, the therapeutic benefit of nature images on people in pain, I've always found that there'll always be an exception. There'll always be somebody in that group who will go, yeah, that one's for me. Oh. <laughs> so it's fun if that's what makes it fun. But the majority do not want abstract. So that's what we tend to go with in the, in the field, in our re design recommendations, is don't pick abstract. Okay. <laughs> So when we look at healing gardens, we have to look at them to match the person's needs in the garden space. And here's just an example of some of the things that we would be looking at. And that's in, um, you can look at, if you have an elderly person with a cane, you have to be very careful about what is the design of where they're walking. Where can they move where the cane won't get caught in a crease, you know, won't cause them to stumble. And then if you're looking at a garden for a child, you have to um, be able to lower the perspective if you're dealing with um, people who are very short. So you might have to just make sure that there's places for them to access the features that you, that you have put into the design for them. And then you have adults in a wheelchair. And again, that has to do with height and with the surface material that the chair will move on. And then Alzheimer's and dementia, I have um, quite a bit of information on that one for you because there's quite a bit available. Now, some of these will be more general and some will be specific. Alzheimer's and dementia has a lot of specifics, whereas people in pain, surgery people, patients in pain, um, there'll be much more of a, a generalized design that would be appropriate for some groups. Is there any data, Dr. Vincent, about... Um, the actual art within the hospital uh, <laughs> being making a difference? Yeah, there's, um, and I don't know if it's official research studies. I can't remember that, um, but there's a lot of comments about hospitals bringing in local art that may not match the therapeutic qualities that art images require for patients. So um, 
you know, a lot of times it's not paid attention to. Okay. Uh, the art will be selected for other reasons. Either it's a gift, um, you're so celebrating a local artist, just other reasons. But if you're looking for um, to, to not cause distress, you're looking to be a healing element, then you have a different set of criteria that you look for. And not every hospital does that at all. Okay. And so here's Claire Cooper Marcus. And she, again, is a prolific author. She's a retired professor of landscape architecture and environmental planning from University of California, Berkeley. And she has really contributed to our knowledge in this field. She was born in London and she has both international and national recognition for research. And she looks at social and psychological implications of design, open space, affordable housing, outdoor space in healthcare settings and environments for children and the elderly. So you can really learn a lot um, from her and her books are very readable and House as a Mirror of Self can actually help you to um, see yourself in the home that you are living in, the one that you picked. You can kind of um, learn more about yourself from what's around you. It's really fun. So she defined therapeutic aspects. And the three definitions that she uses that I've used in my research are relief from physical symptoms, stress reduction, and improvement in overall sense of well being and hopefulness. So, that is the definition of therapeutic aspects that I have used. So, if we look at gardens versus landscapes, what the difference is, there's a lots of ways to look at these differently, but just a generalized explanation of their differences could be that your garden is more highly maintained, contains more plant diversity in it, perhaps, not always, but oftentimes, and may have an educational component such as this one here. You can see the sustainable landscape demonstration garden at Clemson University, and there's even a QR code there where you can go to a related web page. So that is you know, more highly maintained whereas a landscape can be more generalized and something that you pass through, that you view, even from a car that you're driving by. So it can have um, less detail and still be as appealing and attractive. So healing garden characteristics involve built environment, natural environment, and activities and experiences. So we're looking at all of this in both the design end of it and in the use of it. So in the built, are there walkable paths? Is the seating conveniently placed and comfortable? And then is there other things like sculpture and fountains? And is the plant arrangement suitable for drawing you in? And then if we look at the natural environment, the soils are critical. Soils have to be analyzed, tested, plant selection has to match the soil pH the organic matter content, all of that has to take place. And then you also have the beautiful animals that may be drawn there, as well as insects, reptiles, and spiders, which are freaky to some people, but are elements of the natural world in which we are creating. So it's all, you have to look at this, but the activities and experiences also are, um, are social, they're symbolic, as well as kinesthetic. So whether you're sitting, walking, or running there, or are you just gazing or watching? Is it a place where you can talk to others, where you can examine and reflect and wonder? Can you make connections and see metaphors? Can all of this happen in the garden that you're considering healing? So when you're being, um, when, when you're planning for th this kind of experiential, um, garden um is there an element that is involving different colors and um is there an element that involves different seasons that uh reflect you know kind of the the circle of life and and whatnot is um do you take do you take that into consideration absolutely thank you for bringing that up that would be part of the gazing and watching what is there to gaze and watch at it would be part of the installed plant arrangement is it seasonal you know right. when is it that people need to visit this space and then you look at the plant selection under natural environment yeah it's um this is that's all a factor in the design process. 
You got it. As Thank well you. as attracting the pollinators. And, and yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's it. That's right. The choice of plants is very important. And that's where knowing your plant material, having a horticulturist involved is usually pretty essential to getting the garden that you want to have. So a healing garden in the winter has got something to, to, to say. It, it, there's yes. a, it's still a place to go. Yes. Despite the fact that it's, it's right. not right. The, the growing season. Right. And here in South Carolina, a lot of the winter spaces that I've seen that continue to be healing, um, it would be the sculpture and the fountains okay. would still be the draw and the places where you can sit. And then it would be the trees, um, those kinds of things and the animals that might be present. And it does change over time. But if you even look at Falls Park in the city of Greenville, um, they will plant um, parsley and um, violas um, all over the place. So you've got color in the wintertime. So there's right. lots of things that can be done to provide that color. Yeah. Okay. So Thank here you. again, we have some healing garden design aspects. Yeah. And this is the Horatio's Garden for Spinal Injury Patients. And this is in England. And this is very specific to this type of patient. And it was designed, the owners of this, the creators of this, their son died of spinal injury. And they created this in his honor. And um, it's a great web page to visit if you so choose. They have head gardener's tips. So they talk about the plants and the plant materials. The history is there. Um, and it's just really a charming uh, resource to be exposed to. Lots of good information. And here is um, one of their pictures. And if you can imagine the design that goes in to actually getting a hospital patient in their bed out into the garden, this both interior design and exterior design are factors to make this happen. Yeah, this is very wow. impressive. You know, I would love, you know, anytime I've ever been in a hospital bed, I would have loved to got, get wheeled out into a garden. Not bad. <laughs> and, and so many uh, of the way the hospice houses are constructed now is that there is an opening that the bed can be rolled out into mm -hmm. a garden space. Perfect. That's, that's the beautiful future that we can be proud of. And then for pediatric hospitals, there are other things that um, influence the design. And for children amenities, it's considered to be a playful layout. And that can be sculptures. It could be small scale furniture, pathways, um, a rich planting plan, and then providing shade, um, particularly in the South, that would be important. But if people are going to have high levels of physical activity, um, visitors and children should have access to shade. And then an element that comes up in this that is present with just about any healing garden that is near a healthcare facility is um, what is the role of this garden for staff and for the intended patient? And um, sometimes staff will need a separate garden space to be away with, because if there's anybody who needs a healing place, it's definitely going to be the people who work in a healing care facility in a hospital. And um, as well as the patients that are there. Now, I've also seen um, design where staff can sit on benches on the outskirts of the designed garden, like on the other side of a path, and be able to eat their lunch and watch the garden activity, which is very therapeutic for them. And there's an exterior path that they can walk on that mostly if it's a children's garden, the children are playing in the interior section. So there's ways to design this so you can service both staff and a specific patient. And it's just something that should be done. It shouldn't be one or the other. There should be, uh, there should be space and access for both. And when we're looking at, again, children's hospitals, keep in mind that it's not just about physical activity. Some children won't be able to be very physically active. And it's the site the sounds and the scents, both from the windows that overlook this, as well as for people who are out in it. These can all be positive influences towards healing and calming and relieving stress. So you might just also ask yourself, if you work in a hospital or have or been in a hospital in a healing garden, can you recall 
a potential healing aspect of that space, that how it might have affected you or how you might have seen it affect others. So that's just a question you might, if you come up with one, you might want to just enter it into the chat. What was there that you would consider to be healing either to you or to someone else? You saw this or felt it. Chat's not being very active right yet. That's we'll, okay. And yeah. sometimes it, it takes time to think about these kinds of things. They're just not fresh in the mind. It's just fine. This is the um, Greenville Health System uh, Children's Garden, Grove Street. And this is the healing garden. And what's not really, um, this was 2017 when this was taken. And what was really unique about this is that signage to healing gardens is usually missing. So finding a healing garden at a hospital can be an endeavor. And this um, hospital had it right inside the lobby. It was so obvious. It was great, which is why I had to take this picture um, just to celebrate them for making it so available to people. So that's, again, the signage, the availability. If there is a healing garden, can people find it? Because finding one's way in a hospital is one of those problems that is constantly mentioned in the literature, wayfinding, they call it. A lot of people just get lost when they go into a hospital. So this is brilliant. And Dr. Vincent, we did have one chat comment about okay. waterfalls, um, kind mm. of that soothing noise um, and the, the, you know, kind of our white noise of nature. Yes, um, yes. yes. And oh boy, don't I get that one, that sound of the waterfall. You can just feel sometimes your stress just flowing away. It's brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. So here is what the children's um, has, or garden looked like before anything was done to it. And, and they approached our class, our um, sustainable landscape garden design lab class. They approached us to see if we would do a redesign for them. And this was in 2017. And they felt, and they, I'll show you who they are in just a moment. Um, they thought this was overgrown and not healthy. Some of the plants that were, should have been dark green were very yellow. And um, you can see those right in the front of this picture closest to us. So we um, took on this project. And the first thing we did when we visited there was we took a soil sample around where some of these evergreens were and the soil was alkaline, the high pH. And most evergreen shrubs require an acidic soil, a lower pH. So we knew just right then and there that those plants were not suitable. It was not right plant for the right place. So that would have called for a different plant placement, which is what we did. We had those plants removed. And so this is um, Professor um, Shannon Barrett, and she is the interim director of the South Carolina Botanic Garden. And she was the lead um, landscape architect on this project. We worked together on this program. And then the two ladies you see on the right is, um, it's Carmen Quintera and Sarah Pierce, and they worked for Greenville Health System and they were in charge of the project. They're the ones who reached out to us and they were amazing to work with. And where you're seeing um, Shannon Barrett standing on the left, that was the original labyrinth. And a labyrinth is something that is considered to be healing when you walk along it. It's You can always see how to get in and how to get out and you walk at a slow pace so that you can reflect. It helps to, to calm the breathing and your thinking should slow down as you do that. So it was covered with plants um, that weren't all healthy. And this is one of the designs by one of our students. Um, this is at the Clemson classroom. And you can just see the, the different types of designs just by seeing the three that are available here on the wall. Um, very different designs, very um, great ideas that our students come up with for the renovation of this children's garden. And here is an example of the design after it would been installed. And a, a, a mix of elements from some of the students' designs were incorporated into this. And here you have the labyrinth where you can see how easy and how calming it is now. The plant material was taken out of the inner edges and it just became a walking space. And this is a fresh planting, so it might look a little bare because it was just planted. 
Um, plants have not matured yet, but there's animal statuary placed here. There's benches. There's more visibility so you can see in, you can see out. And there is a water feature on one side of it as well. But original trees that were extremely beautiful were um, kept and planted around. So um, it was just a really nice project. And if we look at healing garden design, we can also be looking at dementia and Alzheimer's. And this is where it gets really detailed and involving management and staff is essential. The views of the garden space have to be really visible to residents inside the building as well as outside. And the garden space needs to be monitored for this population if they go out alone. And if there is boundaries and fences, they need to be see-through if nature is available. And the entire garden, this is probably the most um, important element, the entrance and exit has to be visible to the resident to ensure that they have successful navigation to their seats, to the entrance to get back in to where they came from. And reducing visual shadows is important because a lot of times people with dementia will see a shadow on the ground as a whole. And it's something that, that could cause fear that they might fall in. So that's where minimizing shadows on the ground is important. And providing cultural memories, because a lot of times the memories are strong from, from um, you know, a more of a later childhood, early, um, you know, teenage to early adulthood is where the thought of the memories will come from that stay with people. And then, of course, make sure it's attractive and healthy. And some of the information about this, again, can come from Claire Cooper Marcus, Therapeutic Landscapes would be her book to look at with her research embedded in the design tips. And here are some designs for Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, and this one shows you that there are views from the inside. You can see the seating. From the seating, you can see the door. That's essential. The shadows are minimal. There's one big shadow from the building itself. And there's a see-through fence behind where people are, are sitting so they can see more nature. If there was something that like just maybe a parking lot, you would not have to have a see-through fence. If it's something that wouldn't be attractive, you can make it a solid fence. Okay. Here's an example of using statuary to trigger <laughs> people um, in terms of memories. Um, and this is Helen Nebelong, Denmark. And here's Martha Tyson's work. And this is rather large scale at a family life center. And just to give you an example of how the paths are very, um, you can navigate these paths with ease. You're not gonna fall over the, um, there's not plant material cascading all over the edges to cause tripping. It's all very careful. Ins and outs are available. And here's two of her books. if you want more about this type of gardening. And then Tim Lynch, he does designs in the UK. And um, one of my favorite things about his designs is that incorporating the red phone booth that we associate with England and London, um, he puts those in the garden for, for people with dementia. And I think that's brilliant. And we've got our paths going in and out. There's the see-through fence for more nature. But the one thing you might see here that could be a negative would be there are multiple shadows on the ground from the arbor, from the fence, and from the phone booth. That could be a negative. So just keep that in mind when um, you're navigating or designing. And this is just more um, examples of Tim Lynch. And he's really, um, you can, visit online and see some of his work. It's really impressive. And he specializes in elderly and dementia. And here's a before and after shot that's really very descriptive. And this is in Australia. But look at the left and see what it became after a redesign on the right. Really accessible. Very remarkable, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you like the color orange, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> but again, this would probably be a planting. I'm not familiar with plants in Australia, but you may have to do replantings in some of the containers 
if you're looking to have winter um, color in some of this. And here's another before and after. The before is in the small picture on the right. <clears throat> and then after, you can again, you can see that this is very easy to navigate. Um, you can stay on the path. You can get in, you can get out. There's seating available. And then the non-toxic seasonal plantings. Um, sometimes there are in hospitals in particular, there are people who um, with asthma and such that there can't be strong smelling plants or it can cause them distress. So that's just the kind of thing you need to know about the people, again, who are gonna use the space so you can design it appropriately for them. Now, if you were to look at this picture, this is one, if you can evaluate this for dementia use, again, remembering the items that we looked at, and does this score high or low? Is there a feature here that you would change to meet the requirements that we looked at for ideal dementia spaces and gardens? It seems a little maze-like. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very pretty. Uh, there are mm -hmm. a lot of shadows. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's very ornate. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's probably something more of a estate garden than an Alzheimer garden. Uh, that's a really good assessment. And if you look at all of the things there are to trip over and to and to draw you in and fall into, like that fountain in the middle and the um, containers on the ed the edges of it that are all you know cascading down, all of these things could be hazards for someone. So you just you know the smoother kinds of flow worked better. And also making sure that the heights weren't so high that you can't see where you're going. If you were to sit down in the back here, you might get lost. So we don't want that for dementia. But yeah, this is great for a lot of other types of people. It would be perfect. So very good assessment. Now here are some healing gardens with theme-based memorials. And our first one is the Cancer Survivors Park. And that is the most beautiful. Just this um, view of it is one of my favorites. And ever since this was designed, I just, I'm still gawking when I look at pictures and when I go there in person, it's absolutely beautiful. And the purpose was to um, share stories of survivorship and to honor cancer survivors. And um, there's just so much greenery and there's so much beautiful architecture and there's so much access it's, it's really um, an architectural beauty. And this is the building that people can go into and see stories of um, survivors that are posted on the walls and pictures. And I'm just telling you, you know, the people, both Jeff and Laura here can tell you much more about it. And some of you will know a whole lot more about it than, than I do. Um, we've been, our sustainable landscape garden design um, installation and maintenance class is now um, in the process of designing a healing garden for this space. So we're learning more about it and um, it's, it'll be starting soon, the process, but it'll be this semester in the class. So it's one of the um, beautiful projects that we're looking forward to. So we're working with Dr. Vincent and Shannon Barrett and the Clemson students. Um, <laughs> for a space within the park called the Healing Garden. And um, uh, it's, it's a very special place, uh, very close to the labyrinth and very close to the amphitheater. Um, and so we're really, really excited about their design strategies and, and um, their concepts and their ideas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's gonna be a great project. <clears throat> and then nearby, we've got Pedrick's Garden and that's part of Falls Park. And um, this is honoring um, Pedrick Lowry, a member of the Foothills Garden Club and fundraiser for Falls Park who died of breast cancer. And it has a sunflower theme to it, which is very beautiful. And you might have to, to kind of look around for a while to catch that. You could see it from the sky easily. Um, this is a glass statue by Dale Chihuly. So this is um, another um, real draw and beautiful, you can sit around and look, look at this, um, amazing. But this, this would be considered a healing garden as well. 
And you can see you can sit on the edge of the beds. It's really nice. This is one of my classes there, getting a tour from Greg Burris, who works for City of Greenville Parks. <clears throat> and um, this is the Piedmont Physic Garden in Union, South Carolina. And this was designed to honor the family, um, designed this for Dr. Paul Switzer, who was a physician. And this is to honor him in the Union, South Carolina area. And it's also to honor medicinal plants. So it's um, newly started in 2014 and they have um, take student interns to come and work there. And some of our students have gone there to participate in internships and learn about the physic garden. And they have a good web page as well. And they also um, have a Sclepius tuberoso, the butterfly weed, which is a host for the monarch butterfly. And this is the larva. They have tons of larva there, which is just so beautiful. And the people on the right are interns. And then just a, as a conclusion, if you're just kind of um, wondering if you, a healing garden is working on you, usually you can tell just by how you're breathing and how you're feeling, how you're thinking. But if you needed another source, it's just to measure your stress. And you can do this. I mean, most people have now fancy watches that can tell them what their heartbeat is. But another way would just be to take this yourself. And this is just um, instructions with a web page um, for people who want to do that, to be able to test out um, any kind of an outdoor space while they're in it, um, to see if it, if it is not, um, or if it is helping their heart rate. And there's also the, um, the, the stress notice. Um, if you're if you're highly stressed, if you've been exercising, if you have caffeine or have been standing for a long time or sitting, that can all affect your heart rate. So don't expect you know things to be perfect if you've been doing any of those things for a while. So that's what I have for just a conclusion if you need to. But I really think for most of us, just how we feel, how we're breathing and our thoughts, you know, are we moving away from the stress and into the environment around us, the plants, the statuary, the sounds, the smells. Are we watching other people? Are we watching animals? Are we watching the wind? All of those are the things that are gonna be part of our healing garden that can have positive effects on us. So that's what I have. That's great. Uh, one of the things that um, was mentioned in the chat is that um, a person commented on the possibility of having um, healing gardens or therapeutic gardens at airports. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know we have um, statues at, mm -hmm. at our uh, GSP airport, um, but you know, there's obviously anxiety that uh, for some people goes with fl with flying and mm -hmm. you know calming down the the anxiety and and the pulse rate and, and mm -hmm. whatnot. Um, yeah. uh, so I thought I thought that was a good example of another place where you know healing gardens would be useful. Uh, Chicago has a really beautiful um, tower garden, and it produces fresh um, vegetables and herbs. And it can, you can see it. You can go sit around it if you can find it. I just happen to know it was there and find it every time I'm in the airport. But they also um, contribute to the local cafes. The food gets harvested there and you can eat it in the local cafes. So it's a way of it making money, um, you know, having a relationship with the airport. The, high, the hard thing about the plants in the airport is maintenance. It has to be paid for because interior plantscaping is much more high maintenance than exterior. Um, so... It's just one of those things that has to be planned for, but can be, yeah. So here's just another item. Um, if you wanna do this on your own, is just to identify a time you didn't feel well, and then be able to also remember or think about what space either helped or hindered the healing. What was it? And then think about the elements of the space. What were the factors and the features that had their effect on you? And that can kind of help you understand how you have been using healing gardens in your past, perhaps. It's just an idea. So it's important to note that there are people uh, like Dr. Vincent and 
um, Shannon and, and the, their students that have made this their life's work. Um, and, and so as uh, a visitor to these gardens, uh, you passively take in what they've accomplished. Uh, but there is another element that we'll talk uh, about further in detail in other lectures uh, we're getting down and digging in it and and um, and seeing the fruit of your labors and whatnot uh, has a, a therapeutic benefit as well. Um, mm -hmm. So therapeutic horticulture, I, I know that's part of what you teach to your students and whatnot, um, but it, it is a, another aspect of this that is is healing uh, and can be very therapeutic for a number of, mm -hmm. of uh, different, uh, yeah. maladies to include uh, PTSD and, and yeah. Uh, yeah. Other, other disabilities. Yeah. What I um, have been finding, I have the sustainable landscape garden design, um, the, excuse me, the sustainable landscape demonstration garden on the Clemson campus. And I've had some students who have actually requested to work by themselves instead of in teams. They take a, um, it, they take a class, creative inquiry project, where they actually work in the garden as well as conduct surveys and do other things for passersby. And when they tell me they want to work by themselves, um, what they always say is, I feel calm. Uh, it's what I need. It gets me um, away from the classroom environment. And it's just beautiful to hear that we can provide people um, what they need in, in a research educational forum that actually helps them to um, heal and to recover from stresses. It's just great. And one of the basic tenets of lifestyle medicine, including our diet is, is exercise and digging in the dirt is <laughs> clearly a uh, good exercise. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, as That's long true. as you can do it ergonomically correctly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I teach them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. There have been a number of comments in the chat about uh, thanking you for your sharing your expertise with us. Um, and uh, we will take a uh, before picture of the Healing Garden and the Kansas Survivors Park. Mm -hmm. and, and then we'll see uh, pictures as we move forward. And then I think pictures through the various seasons um, and and see how that develops. But we're uh, we're very much looking for the uh, the collegial um, approach to uh, working with you and, and your colleagues in Clemson uh, in, in this park. Yes, and thank you for giving our students the opportunity to gain the knowledge and the experience. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so um, we will uh, have a uh, discussion about uh, obesity. Well, a couple of things in the chat here. We got a little bit of time. Let's see if they're just further uh Hang tight. Uh, thank you and great info. Okay, so <laughs> thank no, you. No questions there. Um, and um, so what we normally do uh, is uh, advertise our, our next um, um, month session, which will be about uh, obesity, um, uh, not from the standpoint of any shaming, but from the standpoint of a healthy approach to um, um, being overweight or obese and, and trying to maintain an ideal um, body weight. Um, and uh, finally, just want to end with um, a, a quote. Um, you know, obviously, one of the things that gardens and horticulture and landscaping and um, urban green space allow us to do is, is what, it, what it's telling us to do is to slow down, slow down. <laughs> Uh, from our rush, rush world. So um, a Chinese philosopher, Lao Tzu, um, nature does not hurry, but everything is accomplished. It gets it done. <laughs> so you got everybody have a great evening. Dr. Vincent, thanks so much again. And we look Thank forward you. to working with you. Thank you. Thank you all.